Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yoss. Okay. Uh, so today I'd just like to briefly perhaps introduce to you the idea of serverless and it will also be a bit of uh, hands-on with the serverless framework. Um, I'm just going to go on. So first of all, the word serverless is a bit of a misnomer. doesn't mean that there's actually no servers. It just means that as a developer, you don't think about the servers. You just think about the code you write and a compute service will deploy and execute your code in the cloud. So recently, it's been gaining a lot of interest. People are moving to serverless. And again, the idea is we move away from servers and infrastructure concerns and allow developers to primarily focus on code. Um, OK, sorry. <coughs> so for large majority of web applications, we have a web server. And traditionally, these web servers are in physical machines, but over time, we moved it into virtual machines, and then containers, and then platforms as a service. And now, some people are saying that serverless is the next stage in this evolution. So what's serverless? Uh, serverless platforms are compute services that run your code in response to events. If you've used platforms like Heroku or uh, DigitalOcean, these are platforms as a service. But functions as a service takes it one level further. So these services let you upload code. So for this example, we use AWS Lambda. Uh, Fast Platforms lets you upload your code. Uh, and then you can set up your code to be triggered in response to events. It could be HTTP events or Lambda, uh, AWS specific events like DynamoDB insertions, SNS messages, and so on. And compute services like AWS Lambda will run your code when they are triggered. And uh, there's no provisioning. Uh, you pay per, uh, per every time you, your code is run. In this case, it's every 100 milliseconds. So there's no under, under capacity or over capacity when you use serverless platforms. You exactly only pay for the execution time that you use. And so in recent years, there's been more and more serverless platforms uh, coming up. We have AWS and a couple of others. So the way platforms execute your code is whenever your function is invoked, there's a container behind the scenes that is provisioned by the platforms. And it takes time to set up and provision these containers. That's why in some services, there's something called a code start. Because at the first in initialization step, it takes time. But after that first uh, initialization, the container can be reused, which leads to significantly faster invocations. So alongside with the uh, cloud computing evolution, we also have sort of architecture evolution. We've moved off from monoliths to microservices, and maybe we might even move to smaller units of code functions. And so AWS Lambda is one of these serverless compute uh, service, uh, compute platforms. And the unit of code is a Lambda function. So if you use Node.js, this is what it looks like. You just supply AWS a function, and it would do something and return some result with the callback. So uh, OK, I'm just going to skip forward. So serverless, uh, so this is a serverless framework. It's a bit confusing. Uh, serverless framework is sort of it's a library that lets you uh, develop and deploy your Lambda functions along with any other resources that your services require. It gives you some, a lot of things out of the box. And it's also provider agnostic, meaning that it's not limited to AWS Lambda, but also other serverless platforms like Azure, OpenWhisk, and Google Cloud Platform. And so there are three main abstractions in the serverless framework and serverless in general. Uh, they are events that trigger functions, which are your code and resources or services which are supporting infrastructure for your code. So functions are just executable snippets of code. These are like Node.js functions that you upload to a serverless uh, compute platform. Um, the best practices are generally you should try to make it have a single, responsible, uh, single responsibility, uh, but it can be challenging to do that. Uh, yep. And each platform would have a different 
uh, range of languages and, ru and runtimes that they support. And so in, in AWS Lambda, we have these following languages and runtimes. Uh, but I think more are being developed as well. So we've seen how, what the functions look like. It looks like this. Uh, it takes three parameters. An event is an input. So in, this, in the case of an HTTP event, this event would be an object that has things like the query string parameters, the HTTP IP address, and so on and so forth. The context is just for metadata. And callback is a function that AWS Lambda expects you to call with the error or a result. So events are things that trigger functions. So these are events in your AWS infrastructure, things like uh, it could be an SNS message, could be a DynamoDB insertion event, S3 upload event. It co could also be scheduled events and, and so on. And each uh, serverless platform would also have a different set of events. So for example, uh, Google, Cloud, Google Cloud Functions, for example, would not be able to trigger functions based on a DynamoDB event, for example, because it's limited to AWS. So these are the events available to AWS Lambda, uh, last I checked. And finally, resources are just supporting infrastructure that your functions might have to uh, consume or talk to. So these are your DynamoDB tables, your S3 buckets, and others outside of AWS. So the key uh, file in a serverless project is the serverless YAML file. So this is basically a DSL, a simplified language for you to describe your serverless applications. So if you look at this, you can see that uh, so the unit of deployment in the service framework is a service, which is a set of related functions. And here we have a function called users create, which is triggered by an HTTP event to the uh, HTTP endpoint post users create. Then we have a users delete function, which is triggered by an HTTP event to the delete users slash delete endpoint. And we can also have resources. So let me just quickly show you uh, what a uh, serverless project looks like. So I've installed the serverless CLI in my machine. So I've just created a, a uh, bare bones uh, serverless project. So we have three files. Uh, handler the JS is where our code lives. So as we've seen, this is just a function that takes some parameters and calls the callback with the error or the response. So in this example, we have we just return uh, a JSON with some message and some and the original event. So the serverless YAML file is again is a DSL. It describes your serverless service. For uh, example, which provider it uses, the runtime, to some optional options here. We have things like stages, we have multiple, we have a test stage, a production stage, and we define our functions, and optionally, any resources that our service requires. So now let's uh, so deploy. So what this step does is, first it compiles the serverless YAML file to a CloudFormation uh, template, in the case of the AWS. So if you look at this dot serverless folder, it's essentially a CloudFormation template with uh, all your lambdas, your IAM rules, your functions, any CloudWatch logs, resources, and so on. So if, it, if you've added a DynamoDB table in your, for example, resource here, it would be compiled to this CloudFormation template that is then uploaded to AWS and passed to uh, CloudFormation, which then builds your AWS resources. So now it's still building, so it might take a while. <coughs> so 
So we can see that it's created the IAM role, log groups, functions, and all right. So AWS has uh, completed our deploying our function, and we can test our live function with the uh, serverless CLI, and that's it. That's the response. Sorry. Can you speak up? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And <coughs> sure. So, uh, so we've tested our live function. And uh, here it's, is the response from the live function. Uh, we can also use uh, the CLI to view the logs to the functions. So in this case, we don't have any logs. So, and uh, yep, that's. So that's the basics of uh, the service framework. Five more minutes. All right, sure. So just have uh, another um, example. So let's imagine we're building a photo filter app. We're building a backend for like a Snapchat uh, application. So in this application, the users would supply an image URL. Uh, the backend would analyze the images, process them, to overlay like emojis that are relevant to the image, and then the users can view this process image. How we how would we build an application like this, for example? Right. Well, the first thing is, so we want to have s the the problem is with functions is a small unit of code, but to build a complex backend, we sort of have to decompose that application to multiple smaller functions. And in computer science, this is known as divide and conquer. You have a problem, you divide it to subproblems, you then divide those subproblems to smaller problems. And so I think one of the things I've learned from doing serverless is that you really have to decompose your problems into very small functions. So in, our, in the case of our photo filter app, we, would, we could decompose it into four functions. So download image would. Uh, Pull, it, pull the image from the URL and save it to our S3 bucket, for example. Analyze image could be use, uh, using uh, an API to analyze the image and save the result to a DynamoDB table. Process image could be reading a DynamoDB table and applying those changes to an image and saving it. And view image could be just pulling the image from our S3 bucket. So following these three abstractions again, events trigger functions which talk to resources. The first function would, might look like this in response to an HTTP request. So for example, in response to an HTTP request, or better with the body is, this can be giving it a, a URL to download the image. Uh, given HTTP request, it calls the uh, download image function, which then saves the image to an S3 bucket. So that's the first function that could work for our backend. And the next could be, in response to that new image in our S3 bucket, an analyze image function could be triggered that calls another API, in this case recognition, to do some image analysis. And that function could then save that those results a DynamoDB table. And in response to the DynamoDB table event, another function could be triggered, process image which does some changes to the image and saves that new image in an an another S3 bucket. And uh, to, so when the users wish to view the image, would, they would just uh, make an HTTP request. And a f another function would return the actual image URLs. So at the end, we have a lot of functions that are part of this single pipeline of uh, our backend. And because it's serverless, it's scalable. So that's cool. Uh, yep, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to share. Uh, yep, thank you. Any questions for Russ? Did everyone kind of get that? Um, yeah. Well, we got good audio from Yoss's talk, right? This is this all the this is going to be on the um, 
the internet on engineers.sg if you want to go through it again a bit slowly or something like that. But yes, that's an excellent introduction about how Lambda functions work, event-driven, the cloud formation stuff. I'm probably going to talk a little bit about the same thing again, just to <coughs> repeat it to your brain. Uh, any questions otherwise? Okay, I think, oh, one from Sebastian. If there's time. Oh, sure, sure, we have five minutes. Actually, my question is about time. Like, How much latency does it introduce? Um, you mean the cold start? Yeah, or? I guess so. Like, is there other times when it takes more time than other times? So yes, so because due, due to the way the uh, provisioning is done, at least for the first, right. so generally the first invocation will be the slowest. And if no other call is made to the function in the next some, in some interval, different platforms have different intervals, for AWS is five minutes, then it can take an unacceptable amount of time. <laughs> the first time you start yes. up, okay. Yep. But beyond that, latency is under 100 milliseconds, but it depends if you're using a VPC or it would affect the uh, latency. But yep. yes, it normally wouldn't be a major deal. Uh, can these uh, Lambda functions execute your downstream functions? Yes, so for example, in in here, for example, in my lambda function, I could be executing other lambda functions. No, not just oh. lambda, but uh, actual other functions like like binaries, you know. binaries or yes, 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 you can, you can. So, for example, uh, the uh, there is a framework called Apex. Which package? I think the way it works is it packages the Go binary, the uh, Go binary. Apex.run. Oh, Apex. Yes, you can. So you can package binaries into your project, and it will be packaged, and your f your function will be able to access it and call it. How is it like the or the behavior of the language? It's asynchronous okay. for Node. Yes. Well, the the language is asynchronous, I guess. But when you run when you run the binary, it would depend on the, the language how it's how it's. Uh, so you can't specify. I want to run synchronous. Yes. Oh wait. For node. Yes. 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 You can make it synchronous. Yeah, you can. Okay. So what's the total run time for that function? Well, it depends on how fast that function runs. I guess. Okay, so if it's synchronous, the run time of the other other function, the separate function. You mean what the bootstrap function? function are you, is that what your question is about? If you call the binary from within the function, it will be added to the time yeah. of the function. So it's not quite effective. Well, it's not bad. Well, if that's what you want, then it's not a problem. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? What, what does the environment look like? Do you have, do you have yep. node modules? Do you have a yes. file system? So uh, depending on the language and runtime, for example, um, the uh, node runtime has image magic built in, the binary. And you can have packages. For example, it's just a standard node project. Uh, I'm going to show you another. Like I don't see a package JSON in there, for example. Yep, so let me show you one that has a package of the oh. JSON. <laughs> so this is another project with the this is the folder filter backend. You have a package of the JSON. And so everything will be packaged and uploaded to AWS Lambda with the packages. As in the, so AWS will install or you can pre bundle it as well. So any binaries you have in this folder will be packaged and you will be able to access it. Well the binaries need to run on AWS. Yes, so you have to compile it under the same environment, yes. And the runtime, you also get a temp folder, uh, but you, uh, might it, you cannot guarantee that the contents of the temp folder will live beyond the same execution, yeah. So it's not, it's because not it might not be reused. Yeah. Yep. It's like 500 megabytes or something. Yeah. And you can also control the memory of the uh, functions. 
But if you double the memory, you also double the cost. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> per hundred millisecond. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.